of uh, the Ford Foundation's new strategy framework and why I think this project in particular and this report is so important. Ford's emerging strategy rose out of an analysis of three interrelated trends in the labor market. The first is the impact, the, the really multifaceted impact of technology on work. The second is the growing fissuring of work and the increasing precarity of workers' lives. And the third is sectoral shifts in the jobs of the future, driven by a range of forces, including demographics as well as technology. And our long-term goal here at Ford is that workers, particularly low-wage people of color and women workers, have increased economic security due to the adoption and enforcement of strengthened labor laws and private sector practices that respond to changes in technology and to trends towards greater contingency and precarity. We'll approach this by grant making in three broad areas. The first is building connections among all stakeholders, including workers, and advocates, academics, the business sector, and technologists, identifying and promoting public policy and private sector solutions, and building the voice and power of workers to engage with stakeholders and shape those solutions. Now, for those of you already familiar with this project and Steve Zizzelli's paper, it should therefore be clear about why we are so excited about both. There, there are a lot of interesting future of work projects out there. It seems like a new one pops up every 30 seconds. Um, but I think this one is really unique for several reasons. First, even though it does focus on the impact of technology on work, Annette Bernhardt and the team of researchers she's assembled are not distracted by the hype. Rather, they are looking deeply at the most impacted sectors and producing nuanced research grounded in deep expertise. Second, Steve and his fellow researchers are not just looking at the quantity of jobs lost or gained, but also how to ensure that technological change doesn't further deteriorate the quality of jobs. Third, they don't stop at a description of the problem. They're putting forth very concrete policy solutions, many of which can be tested right now at the state and local level and are as important to the present of work as the future of work. And finally, this is a genuine partnership between an academic institution and an organization deeply grounded in real life experiences of workers. So the research and recommendations are informed by that reality and actually are more likely to move forward because of those connections. So I'd like to end by highlighting a quote which really um, stood out for me in Steve's paper. And if you broaden it beyond the trucking industry, I think it very concisely sums up why the Ford Foundation is focusing on the future of work. So Steve says, how technology changes truck driving is not an inevitability. And the action or inaction of policymakers will be key in determining which technologies make their way onto our public roadways, who benefits from this innovation, and who may be left behind. So now I can't think of a better person to follow that quote then Derek Murns, Executive Director of Working Partnerships USA. Thanks, Anna. Um, uh, four years ago, uh, my organization had the privilege and pleasure of, of launching a campaign called Silicon Valley Rising. That was a joint campaign with the labor movement, three unions, um, to organize subcontracted workers in the tech sector. We're talking about janitors, food service workers, shuttle bus drivers, security officers. 
That campaign has had enormous success with almost 6,000 workers joining unions and fighting for better wages, working conditions. And through that campaign, we found that our uh, worker, our union allies and our worker advocate allies were caught up in this debate about the future of work. And we were being told, um, and I do mean told, um, by reporters, by policymakers, by technologists and business leaders that the future of work was that there would be no work. There's a robot apocalypse coming. There, we, why are we bothering organizing workers? We need to be thinking about a whole new framework for how people get income in the absence of jobs. And that presumption of inevitability was, um, was overwhelming. And so we started to strategize uh, with the labor center uh, and with Ken and Aneta about the fact that unions and worker centers and advocates needed real, real time information on what kind of technologies were being adopted in the industries where low wage workers and workers of color, immigrant workers, um, uh, are primarily uh, um, uh, have those jobs. And we needed to be able to think about our organizing strategies for the future, right? Like how, given what kind of technologies are coming online, how are those likely to shape industries re or reshape industries? And what are the, what could be the worker's agenda for technology that has worker voice, that has workers at the center and has workers not only reacting to technology, but helping to implement and helping to decide with policymakers and business leaders what gets adopted. That's why we started this project. And so today is about the first, um, the first of those studies and Ken will talk, uh, talk about that. What we're gonna, um, I'm gonna go over some logistics really quick. We have a ton of participants on this. We're really excited to have you all. So you're all muted. <laughs> um, there's a chat box uh, on your right hand side for questions. You can feel free to put those at, as Steve goes through the presentation, he'll spend about 30 minutes doing that. Please feel free to add a question in there. We'll be tallying them. And at the end, we're gonna make sure we have time for questions. We're also recording this. Um, so just know that um, we're recording the, the webinar for future use. Um, and with that, making sure I don't, haven't forgotten anything, I'm gonna kick it to Ken Jacobs, who is the chair of the UC Berkeley Labor Center. Thanks, Jerrica, and we're really pleased to be able to partner partnered with Working Partnerships USA on this important project. And as we were getting into these questions of the future of work, it became very clear that in order to understand how new technology is likely to affect workers and how we can best shape that future so it works for working people, that it's essential to understand what's happening in particular industries and particular occupations. And we needed to get into the ground level uh, and really see what was what was happening uh, very concretely. And so we've commissioned a series of studies looking at some of the key industries that are likely to be transformed by technology. And future studies include food and non-food retail, logistics, and healthcare. And today we're excited to share with you the first of those studies, a look at self-driving trucks and the trucking industry. And I really want to thank the Ford Foundation, Kellogg, and the Open Society Foundation for the support of this research. We commissioned uh, University of Pennsylvania sociologist Steve Vaselli to conduct this study. He's one of the nation's leading scholars of the freight industry and uh, labor market, wrote The Big Rig, Trucking and the Decline of the American Dream, and was described by Trucker.com as having, quote, steel cord forearms. This report release has been making the rounds in the supply chain industry media outlets, and we're thrilled at the attention that it's receiving in the industry, among policymakers, among advocates, and having uh, everyone here on the webinar today. So Steve, take it away. Thanks, Ken, and Derica, and Anna. Um, All right, thank you everyone for joining us today. I, I appreciate your time, so, uh, so let's jump right in. As I'm sure you all know, trucking has been uh, suggested as one of the first industries that will be transformed by automation. And this has led to some predictions of massive job loss, which I'm sure you're also familiar with. Uh, some of these suggesting that as many as 1.8 million or sometimes even 3.5 million workers could lose their jobs as a result of self-driving trucks. 
But none of these studies and, and predictions take into account the organization of the work being done and what it would mean for the larger process of moving freight to automate the driving task itself. Uh, just as importantly, these studies don't take into account the important differences that exist uh, within the trucking industry in terms of the characteristics of jobs, what those jobs pay, how many hours drivers work, um, and thus we don't have a good handle on what potential job losses mean um, for, for these workers. So what I've found in my research is that contrary to the uh, more apocalyptic predictions of job loss, we're, we have approximately 294,000 jobs at risk. The concern is that many of these jobs are among the best trucking jobs. Some have some of the highest wages. Um, though we do have in long haul driving some of the, uh, the toughest jobs as well, as I'll explain in a little bit. So coupled with this loss of potentially good paying jobs, we have substantial growth that's likely among local jobs and delivery jobs, uh, which unfortunately don't pay nearly as well as some of these long haul jobs. And these are also some areas, particularly port truck driving, where we see some important labor abuses, including the uh, extensive use of misclassified employees as independent contractors. So let me tell you a little bit about how I arrived at these conclusions and what the research consisted of. Uh, my data is, is composed of a number of interviews with leaders in the industry, computer scientists, engineers, and those developing the technology, as well as those who might be affected by it or adopted, and including trucking firms and drivers. I've also um, had discussion with academic experts and, and, and labor as well. And all this data is, is used in a four-step process to try to understand what the uh, impacts of self-driving trucks would be. The, the first step in that process was to understand what is the technology that companies are trying to develop? What are they trying to build? What's it gonna be capable of? And then from that, I developed a set of scenarios that I'll, I'll discuss in a bit of how that technology might be adopted and the way it could be integrated within different processes for moving freight. Once I'd identified those processes, I overlaid them on top of the existing industry segments to try to understand where adoption was most likely. And then once I'd done that, I looked at the potential labor impacts including the number of jobs that might be lost, but also the number of jobs that might be created and the way existing and remaining jobs might be transformed. Um, and from that, I identified alternative scenarios that we might consider and policy responses um, to uh, the different problems of potentially worker displacement as well as the quality of, of future jobs. So let's dig into those findings. Um, and we have to start, as I started the research, with where we are now. So there are a number of important debates among developers of self-driving trucks as to how this technology could best be brought to market and what it might best be used for. Uh, and there, there are a range of different questions that developers are asking about the right mix of, of technologies to actually achieve self-driving. And these are not small matters. They're certainly ones of, of, of important consideration about the costs of different technologies, the strengths and weaknesses of those technologies, all of which, of course, create uncertainty about what that final uh, technology that comes to market will be. And in the trucking industry, we have to be aware that right now there are numerous different ways that freight gets moved. And there may be multiple technological solutions to, um, to self-driving in different, different segments. But what is really clear right now among almost all developers is that they believe most uh, that local driving is the furthest away and that we're several decades away at least from, from the ability to move uh, these large vehicles through congested areas and in urban areas where the driving environment and the driving tasks are simply more complex. And so in the near term, we're looking at a combination of sensors uh, and computer processing that will allow vehicles to navigate on highways. Um, and so this technology is going to intersect with this wide variation that we have within the trucking industry in the way that freight gets moved and the quality of jobs that, uh, that result from that different, those different ways to move freight. 
Um, in general, truckload driving, for instance, one of the largest segments, uh, we have some very tough working conditions, but because of the long hours that drivers work and the premium that they earn for, for living on the road for long periods of time, the wages are still relatively high. In less than truckload and in parcel um, operations, we have very high wages and, and good working conditions. And in general, as the, uh, as the image suggests about port drivers and delivery drivers, for hire local jobs tend to be much worse paid than long haul drive jobs. And this is particularly true in that port segment of the industry, as I'll discuss in a bit. Okay, so that's where we are now, but where, where are we going? Um, well, we often get the sense from proponents of self-driving that we should just let this technology run its course as if it's some inviolate natural process with a set of inevitable outcomes. And I argue in the, in the report that this is a fundamentally flawed view. The development of these technologies has already been heavily influenced by public investments in basic science and technology that shaped the kind of technology that we currently have available to work with in self-driving. And we, and we shouldn't forget that as these debates about um, shaping this technology and its outcome continue. Um, this technology is going to fundamentally affect the system that delivers all the goods that you and I consume, uh, which means that the efficiency and safety of our roadways, the air quality and livability of our cities, and the jobs of several million workers who do the important work of getting us all the stuff that we need are gonna be affected. And these matters are simply too important to leave unattended. Uh, we have both the right and the responsibility to ensure that this technology fosters a safe and efficient freight industry uh, that provides good jobs. And that's not gonna happen without, without policy. Okay, so I've developed six potential adoption scenarios out of my conversations with developers and understanding the aims that they have for the products that they would like to bring to market and how those products might be might be used within existing freight systems. Um, <clears throat> I don't have time to go into all of these. They range from platooning in the upper left-hand corner there where trucks draft off one another um, in, in order to save fuel with no labor impacts at all, all the way down in the bottom right-hand corner to a full facility-to-facility -facility automation or level five driving where the no driver is, is required at any point in the process. I wanna to focus today as the report does on what many believe is the most likely scenario with significant labor impacts in the foreseeable future. And that's what's often called exit to exit self-driving. In this scenario, local drivers, human drivers, bring trailers from customers to a facility near an interstate exit. I'm calling these autonomous truck ports. At that point, that local driver or some other staff at the facility will uncouple the trailer from the human driven truck and couple it up to a, an autonomous truck. That autonomous truck will then carry the freight over its long distance segment of its travel to another autonomous truck port where the trailer will be detached and passed off to another human driver for final delivery. Um, at these ports, it's important to understand that in, in the history of trucking, technological change is often about the combination of multiple technologies. So at this port, because of that change, that segmentation, if you will, in the process of moving the freight, other technologies could become important. And the most important one in this, in this part of the um, scenario is what is called digitization or the Uberization of freight. So the fact that so much freight would be moving through one point um, and that trucks would be moving through this, this spot at, a, at regular intervals, there could, there's the possibility to put freight transactions onto a platform, similar to what we use today for, um, that Uber and Lyft use today for matching up passengers and, and cars for passenger transportation. Something similar could happen um, with freight transportation as well. Okay, so if that's the most likely adoption scenario, I then overlaid that with the um, existing segments of the industry. Now this chart is, is quite complex and please uh, don't try to absorb the whole, the whole thing right now. It's, it's in the report and you can take a closer look at it. But what the chart illustrates is how I went about identifying the jobs at risk in this, from this scenario. So I looked at the characteristics of each segment that were suggested by different developers and 
experts and, and players in the industry, the kinds of characteristics that they thought would influence the adoption of technology like this. So obviously in the, uh, at the, on the left-hand side, the left-hand column is, is the environment, um, whether or not the, the next column is the amount of uninterrupted highway driving, the number of tasks that drivers do other than driving, the kinds of facilities and customers that they have, route regularity, et cetera. And what you see in the rows are the different segments of the, of the industry. And what should stand out to you, I hope, is that there, there, there's one section of this graph, the top two, or this table, these top two rows, that is mostly, mostly green. Um, and what, this, what these are, are for hire truckload, including dry van and refrigerated, where drivers are driving long distances and doing relatively few other tasks and servicing many of the largest freight shippers in the country. In addition to that is less than truckload and parcel line haul. Now what line haul is, is it's, it's part of a larger process of combining freight from say one city at a terminal according to its destination. So local pickup and delivery drivers will go out and pick up smaller shipments and then combine them into a trailer full at a company controlled terminal. Those, that combined shipment will then be moved by a line haul driver over that long distance portion of the travel to another carrier facility where that shipment is broken down. And for, for those of you who are, who are familiar at all with the way that parcel carriers like UPS work, this is how your one package gets combined into a full truckload worth of goods that gets moved over its longer distances. So the drivers in that one portion of that process, the line haul drivers, who are moving those full trailers over long distances, they look a lot like the drivers in truckload. And those are the two primary categories of, of drivers at, at risk. Now, our concern here, as I, as I suggested at the beginning of my findings, is that these long haul jobs often are the best paying jobs out there. Even though in the full truckload segment where we have lots of turnover, um, problems with worker misclassification and other issues, because drivers work such long hours and get a premium for being away from home for weeks at a time, they make high wages and high annual earnings. Um, in addition to those drivers, also at risk are some, some of the best, the very best trucking jobs, which include line haul at less than truckload and, and parcel jobs. Together, these represent that 294,000 jobs that I argue is at the highest risk from, of, of loss from automation. At the same time, because of growth in e-commerce, um, overall economic growth, and the local driving that will be required on either side of this autonomous, um, autonomous truck movement, we're gonna have the growth in local jobs, which could easily um, equal what we see lost in long haul driving. And so these jobs are, tend to be much lower paid we have much greater competition in local markets and the prevalence of some, some pretty unsavory labor practices in some parts of it, including um, around ports. Local pickup and delivery, of course, is growing because of the um, fantastic growth in e-commerce. And in that area, we're seeing a proliferation of different labor arrangements to try to lower the cost of last mile delivery. And I would, I would suggest things like Amazon Flex and Amazon's new delivery service provider model, uh, threaten to, to um, keep the wages of these workers low um, and potentially undercut some better employers such as, such as UPS. In thinking about these impacts and the policy implications of them, it's really important to realize that we're talking about two broadly different kinds of impacts here. Obviously, we have the potential for job losses. And a greatest concern here is that many of the workers who are in the you know, moderately well-paying jobs that are tougher and long haul have stayed in those jobs because they live in rural areas. And so these workers um, who are predominantly older white men um, with a high school degree do not have many other job options around them. In fact, very few that will pay comparable wages to this. And so their situation is one in which Retraining, for instance, may not be um, particularly effective. And 
In contrast to that, we have lots of new workers coming into the industry who are employed, who are going to be employed in local driving and also in last mile. And these tend to be younger, disproportionately workers of color and immigrants. Um, and in, for those workers, we really need to be concerned about job quality. And so they're, they're really quite disparate impacts um, of, of this shift to automation and the growth in last mile. Okay, so where do we go from here? Given these potential impacts, what should we do about them? In the report, I suggest a series of, of policy um, efforts that might address this, and we can really think about them as fitting into, into three buckets. One of which is to develop an overall industry approach to these issues for worker, to ensure that workers can have good, stable careers um, and to support those workers who may be displaced. And I've called for the creation of, of what I call Trucking Innovation and Jobs Council. It's critically important given the impact on workers, communities, um, and, 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 truck, and the trucking industry that we have a collaborative effort to understand and address the potential impacts here. Um, the next bucket is really to ensure that we have strong labor standards. Um, and worker protections. And so in this bucket, we really want to think about, you know, what are those remaining jobs and the growing jobs? And how can we ensure that many of the problems that currently exist don't spread? In fact, I don't think that many new problems are going to arise from uh, automation for existing jobs. I think we're going to see the spread of existing bad practices. And the good news about that is we know what those problems are and we can begin to address them today before automation even has an effect, we can prepare workers for some of the negative impacts that automation may lead to right now. And so these could include um, addressing independent contractor misclassification, probably the largest single issue affecting most, uh, most of the bad segments of the industry, but also some issues around local driving where we have lots of unpaid hours and that, that drivers work. And as we see the increase in in local driving uh, as a portion of all the work done in the industry, that uh, the issues around whether or not drivers are, are paid, whether or not their time is used efficiently, um, and similar issues are going to just increase in importance. Finally, the, the third component, major component of the policy recommendations is to really think about how we can promote um, innovation and to harness this technology to create uh, a more efficient, safer, um, trucking industry that has good jobs, something that could achieve the social and economic goals and environmental goals of the broadest collection of, of stakeholders. And just to spend a, a couple minutes on what that might look like, at the end of the report, I, I propose an alternative scenario, which is one that I spend some time discussing in the, um, in the potential adoption scenarios what we could achieve if we had proactive public policy. So in this scenario, what you're, what you're seeing is um, that exit to exit scenario um, modified so that in front of that autonomous truck in the long haul segment is a human driven truck. Now, the reason that we might wanna do that, and actually there are several really important ones. First of all, it's a much less um, difficult technological lift uh, to do this because the that following truck doesn't need to have all of the artificial intelligence that is required for it to navigate a complex environment on its own. Instead, it can take its its cues from that lead truck. In addition to that, having a driver in that lead truck is important for safety and all the um, unanticipated things that truck drivers deal with on an everyday uh, basis, such as blown tires and other weather and other sorts of unexpected disruptions in the, in, in the freight movement process. And so what this driver could look like, or the job for this driver would look like, is similar to what we see today in doubles and triples on the highway. So you may have seen on the interstates a truck pulling multiple trailers connected together. These jobs are often the highest skilled and best paid, uh, and they employ the most experienced and safest drivers. And what happens there is we have, you know, excellent jobs that contribute to a much more efficient process. And I think we could achieve something like that with these platoons of human and self-driven trucks. 
at the autonomous truck port because of the competition that is going to be um, that has always been present in in local truck driving and could intensify as a result of of this segmentation of the local driving as well as the additional technology of digitization digitization of freight uh, transactions um, we need to be very concerned about how risks from asset ownership as well as inefficiencies it could be put on the backs of, of workers like we see at, at shipping ports today. And it's critically important that these workers be, have, have protections, have the right to join with other workers and unions if they choose, um, or to um, you know, not, have the, not be misclassified as independent contractors who are responsible for um, the costs of, of buying the trucks that they operate. In addition to this, we're gonna need protections around um, the uh, payment for um, un lots of work that goes unpaid today, like sitting at a dock. And what this would allow us to do is to have, you know, local clean trucks that are the most efficient they can be, um, which in the future hopefully will, will include lots of electric trucks and, and others. In addition to this, we need to be concerned about the growth, what will likely be very strong growth in last mile delivery jobs and gig jobs particularly those that um, are growing as a result of e-commerce, where we see strong pressure um, to, to employ independent contractors at relatively low wages using their, own, using their own jobs or using their own vehicles. Okay, ultimately, whether we get that scenario or not um, is gonna be a matter of policy. Uh, whether or not driverless trucks replace the best trucking jobs, um, with low wage gig work or lead to family supporting jobs and healthy communities is going to depend on, on policymakers, drivers, and the industry coming together to proactively shape how the industry evolves. All right. And with that, I will leave it on Steve. Great. Thank you, Steve. So this is Derica again, and I'm going to facilitate some of the questions that are in the chat. Um, uh, Steve, the first question, that, that came up earlier in your presentation was from uh, someone who says that uh, he or she, I think this is he, I think this is James, um, worked in a campaign to move commercial truck driving out of communities of color, or at least distributed equally. Um, at some point in his past, he did this campaign, and he's really wondering what is the impact of the shifting trucking industry on communities of color and low-income communities from an environmental justice perspective? Well, I think this is, you know, one of the critical questions is, you know, whether or not we can incentivize the use of the best technology to do the job in the most efficient way. And I think the, you know, the, the most prominent example of this is obviously in, in courts, uh, where we've seen that, you know, it's, it's just not possible for misclassified employees to, uh, to invest in the newest and, and best technology, that is going to increase um, the, the pressure to use cheaper and cheaper stuff is, is gonna remain while the technology available to us gets better and better, but also more expensive, which means that we're leaving much more on the table um, if we have workers who can't afford the newest technology. Right now, what we see in these, in these operations oftentimes are local trucks which are former over-the-road trucks. Uh, an over-the-road truck might cost you $150,000, but you could buy something for less than a third of that price to use locally because it doesn't have to be as dependable. As we move good. into electric trucks and trucks that could be very clean exactly where we want them to be, which is in our congested urban areas, those yeah. trucks are going to cost multiples of what a long-haul truck costs. And it's simply not going to be possible for um, these, these misclassified workers to buy those trucks. And so, this is a great example of where multiple stakeholders are gonna be impacted and we need to have a larger discussion about, you know, what kind of freight industry do we wanna have? What, what are the goals of that in terms of our communities, our environment, and the, and the quality of jobs? Um, Ken, just so you know, you're unmuted as well. This next question um, is a good one. Uh, do, do we have thoughts about how to talk to truckers and people in the trucking industry to help them blame the right enemy, corporations, finance, capital, et cetera, 
versus immigrants and people of color um, in this scenario and in this narrative? I have some thoughts, but Ken, Steve, do you want to start? Well, I, I can start us off. I, I think, um, you know, there, a lot of conversations with truckers. there are, there is opposition to, to the kind of, um, you know, collaborative efforts that, that I'm proposing here and that I think um, many would, would support. But it's also important to understand that within the industry, they're operating with the economics that exists and that economics is fundamentally shaped by policy. And so, you know, and this really heightens the importance of understanding how it is that, you know, whether or not we have clarification around what an independent contractor is directly impacts our ability to have an efficient system. Now, the players within that, within the industry, are going to play by the rules that are set. And um, what we need to do is think about what those what those rules are. Mm -hmm. And I would... I. Do you have something? Go ahead, Ken. I, I was just going to add, it's also going to be very important in terms of for those work, as, as Steve mentioned earlier, for those workers who don't have mm -hmm. uh, opportunities, who may have invested in their trucks and now are finding themselves with a big investment and nothing they can use it for in the future, that we're going to need to have some mitigation strategies, some way that they can come out of this with a livelihood. And if we don't, those are the kinds of divisions we will likely see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, building on that last question, um, we have a question here that's very interesting. Some of the efforts to organize ride-sharing drivers, so Uber, Lyft um, style drivers, um, and then this person is pointing to the IDG, the Independent Drivers Guild um, in New York, have started to put those drivers on a path towards getting a commercial driver's license and becoming truckers. So Jane, the last question seems incredibly relevant. Um, and it would be because it would be very easy for older, whiter drivers to see these new Uber drivers who are immigrants, people of color, et cetera, um, uh, as, and blame them for job loss. So it's less a question, more of a statement. And I just want to say, I totally like, I think that is a challenge. And one of the things I'm really excited about is that through you know, this, this report is the first of the five um, and the, the network of unions and worker centers and uh, worker advocates who are excited not just about this report, but about working together around a narrative and, uh, and uh, a story that really makes the connections for folks and then talks about financialization and the role of Wall Street in, the, in driving this is part of our task. Um, that we have. So, so Katie, you're, you're signed up to, to help with that. Um, Steve, here's another question. I live in a community on a major trucking corridor with two large truck stops. Each has at least two attached fast food restaurants, a Wendy's, McDonald's, Subway, two large gift snack shops with restrooms and showers. If there is a big reduction in human drivers, it seems like those businesses might be at risk. Have you done any research on the economic and social impacts on those ancillary businesses? I haven't, but I, you know, and I think this would be something that a trucking and uh, innovation and jobs council would, would need to address very, very quickly. And it's important to, to understand that, um, you know, trucking is a huge sector. Um, it, it, it's a big chunk of our economy and it, it, it influences how retail works, how warehousing works. It, it's, it's the circulatory system of the economy, some, some like to say. Um, and so we need to think about, you know, what are the follow on impacts uh, of, you know, a reduction in, in this workforce or transformation in these jobs? Again, um, it, 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 it's going to affect the entire country. And this is actually a, a place, I think, I hope, where we can bring people together. Um, that is a blue and a red state issue um, that, that really, where this process is going to affect both rural and, and urban areas um, differently, but it's going to be part of the same transformation. And so I, I think this is an area where, you know, there's a lot of, of common concern and, and I hope we can develop some common ground. Great. Next question. Um, are there policy ideas that you all are considering that shift the burden of paying the costs of displacement and, um, and both workers? Uh, that shift the, the, the burden of paying the cost of displacement um, and the 
infrastructure adaptment onto the financial beneficiaries of automation, i.e. VC, Wall Street, Silicon Valley, et cetera. What thoughts do, do um, we have on that? Ken, I see you're, you're smiling. Good, good question. <laughs> Um, but, but yes, Steve, go ahead. Yeah, so in, in the report, what, what I proposed was uh, what I call an autonomous vehicle mileage tax. Mm -hmm. That's what I think you should talk about. And, and so, you know, this would, would be a per use tax potentially on, on miles, uh, which is something that, you know, vehicle mileage tax is, is something that has gained a lot of, uh, a lot of traction among policymakers to, um, to combat some of the problems that, that come from the good news of increasing fuel efficiency. And so when fuel efficiency you know, increases, we get less revenue from gas taxes. And so we need to shift to, to new models to, to fund our roads and, um, and other transportation related infrastructure. And so you know, vehicle mileage tax has been proposed to tax you know, users. And I think something similar uh, around automation could be done to tax the, the vehicle miles traveled by these autonomous trucks, for instance, uh, in a way that could support, you know, um, in particular workers who might be displaced with bridges to retirement, unextended or extended unemployment benefits, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I should uh, let me follow up on that real quickly. Um, the, you know, we have to realize most of the funding that has gone into the development of these technologies is public monies. Um, you know, with oftentimes in the truck. Um, space with very good intention to replace drivers who were moving fuel to forward operating bases um, in war zones. And so, uh, you know, the Defense Department has, has been very interested in self-driving trucks for a long time, and they've used tax dollars to develop, you know, to de develop this technology as well as, you know, numerous sensors and computer science that have gone into it. A lot of the, you know, the intellectual property that, that exists today is, is arguably public property. And so um, I think, you know, we have a right to ensure that or to be a part of the discussion about where these benefits um, are going to go. That's great. Okay, one more. Um, what has been the industry response, such as trucking employers to the policy recommendations? And I'll reiterate something that Ken said before kicking it back to you, Steve, because you follow this stuff much more closely. But, but at the beginning, um, it has been shocking for those of us who do not follow, believe it or not, the trucking um, industry, media blogs, et cetera, how every day we're getting two or three pings um, and it is just really got the penetration within that market uh, about the report has been fascinating and great to watch. Absolutely. I mean, there, there's a, there's a hunger for, um, you know, new ideas there, are, you know, Course they're going to, there's, of course, there's going to be resistance to uh, policy that, that affects labor standards and, and things like that. I, that that's um, unavoidable. But I think in the trucking industry, we have a clear case of, of a labor market that's in crisis. And, and I, the industry itself can't deny that. It's had a shortage. Um, it has claimed it has a shortage of workers for some time because of the high turnover rates and and, and frankly, the, the tough conditions in many of the segments. And so um, there will certainly be some in the industry who say, you know, don't worry, we've got this covered. We can, we can ensure that workers don't, don't bear the brunt of this. It's, I don't think we can, um, we can allow that to happen given the industry's track record um, in, in terms of being able to even uh, recruit enough workers for itself and, mm -hmm. and its reliance on public monies to retrain those workers who are going into these high turnover segments. So um, the good news is that I think there are lots of employers who are looking for a, a more sustainable path out of this. And I think they can be engaged to, you know, be a partner in a larger process that says, hey, let's make sure that we have, you know, safe, efficient truck drivers who are not driving tired because they're, you know, trying to squeeze in a few more hours of work in order to pay the bills at home you know let's make sure that this technology you know makes these jobs better and i think there's a portion of employers and i, I am fortunate to get to talk to some of them um on a regular basis who are ready to you know move forward and see what an alternative to the current you know high turnover um, industry approach would look like that's great 
Well, I want to just thank everyone for joining us. Um, we'd love your help to share the report with folks um, in your networks. Um, we had over 50 people join this webinar at one point. Uh, so we have a pretty cool, if I do say so myself, infographic summary at driverlessreport.org. You can uh, spread it around, send it to your networks. If you have questions, you can always email us um, or give us a call. And if you go to that site, there are buttons to share on Facebook, Twitter, et cetera. Um, to in close, just I want to say from our perspective, uh, both I think I speak for Ken and Aneta and um, for our team, we are thrilled to have this report. So again, this is about putting the agency back into the workers' hands in some ways to say, hey, we have, we have ideas and thoughts and we're now armed and really thinking about how do we go to policymakers, how do we go to industry, and how do we start to implement um, the right organizing framework to create the scenario that we want rather than the scenario that happens without us. So Ken, you want to say some final words? Yeah, I have to say thanks everyone for joining us today. And I think this, you know, and thanks Steve for the report. It really provides a very important and useful framework to understand the potential effects of technology on workers, not just on the quantity, as Anna mentioned, but the quality of jobs, on wages, benefits, and the organization of work, along with laying out some very clear policy recommendations and steps we can take take to shape how the technology is used and what the outcomes are for workers. And as Derek has noted, it isn't inevitable what is going to happen here. It is, it is a question of how we shape that in terms of what this will mean for working people. And just to note in California right now, as, having, as we're having this discussion around, will these jobs be independent operators? Or will they be workers, you know, low road jobs or high road jobs? The Dynamex case and the response to that is a very important part of this discussion of course, the California Supreme Court ruling around uh, independent contractors and uh, the definition of employee. And, and we're seeing lots of pushback on that. And that's gonna be something that uh, will be very important as to how this rolls out. Uh, and as noted at the beginning, this is the first of a series of studies and we look forward on, on key industries and we look forward to uh, getting those studies out uh, in the coming period to look at food, non-food retail, logistics, healthcare and to working with people on a, a set of very important issues that'll shape where we're going uh, with work and with technology in this country. So thank you. Thank you all.